Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're really happy to have um, with us tonight um, Dr. Uh, Jay Kohlhaus, who is an associate professor of moral theology at Loris. Um, Jay has done a number of presentations in person for us. Um, he's always interesting and challenging. And um, I'm happy that he could uh, do this tonight to address, I think, uh, uh, a topic that um, didn't get um, addressed very well generally in the media and which really has a much broader context um, for us to understand. So um, I uh, appreciate um, him being willing and able to do that. If you haven't read his article in US Catholic, there, there's a link to it uh, on our webpage for the Winter Forum. And um, just um, a kind of a future note, be watching for a book by uh, Jacob Kohlhaus coming out probably this summer. Um, so um, for those of you who have not been with us before, um, in lieu of um, actual conversation, um, we will um, format the discussion through the chat box. So if you um, are familiar with that, great. If you're not too familiar with that, it's not rocket science. Um, if you just look at the bottom of your screen, about in the middle, there should be a little icon that says chat. And if you uh, click on there, um, you are able to uh, type a comment or ask a question. Um, it can be directed directly to um, Jake. And so no one else will know um, who asked the question and you won't be able to see anybody others, anybody else's questions as well. Um, if it looks like it's an immediate concern, um, Jake will stop and address it um, at that time. Otherwise we'll save questions and comments uh, for the end of the um, program. So welcome to all of you. Um, Dr. Kohlhaus, welcome to you. The forum is yours. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, again, it would have been lovely to join you all in person as, as I've done in the past, um, but here we are. Uh, but hopefully staring down at the end of, of this kind of social gathering and back to a normal um, in-person get together here soon. Uh, we can all hope that's what the spring holds for us. Um, so as, as Dave said, uh, my research primarily is involved in uh, Catholic theology of the family and ethics around uh, the family. And so I've spent the last few years working on a book that's coming out with Georgetown this year, which I'm very excited is finally um, out there. Uh, and I also recently worked on an edited volume on a series of essays from a, a Catholic uh, academic conference. So I was kind of putting together what's going on in the field. Um, so from that background, I've got, I think, a pretty good view of, of the history, the recent history, and the context of, of some of the stuff that we see uh, in the media. And so tonight, what I want to focus in on is one particular episode uh, and give some explanation uh, of what's going on there, and then really pose some questions about um, what this means, where, where we're at as, as American Catholics at this point in history, uh, in relation to our understandings of the family, to what extent those need to evolve, to what extent those can evolve, to what extent those need to um, remain secure, and to what extent those can remain secure, right? So there's a lot of different questions that I, I'm hoping to raise tonight. So what I'm gonna do is uh, begin uh, by just sharing uh, sort of my thoughts on, um, on Pope Francis' statements, um, and I'm losing track here already. I think they were back in, at the end of October. Um, there was a new um, documentary on the Pope released, and in that it contained some rather provocative statements uh, about his understanding of, of civil unions and their place within the church. And so as, uh, as happens, uh, of course, the internet had lots of lots of uh, theories going on about what that uh, included lots of different takes on that. Um, so we're going to look at that as sort of our starting point um, to think about where Francis might be thinking um, about moving Catholic understanding of families, particularly in light of, of same-sex parenthood. 
but then from there, I, I'm hoping to open it up uh, to a little bit bigger discussion of, of the fact of Catholicism today in, in the US and, and elsewhere, encountering broad diversities in human families and having to make sense of that and provide a faithful witness uh, in that context. Um, so I would ask that as you uh, type questions in, I'm happy to entertain those. Uh, if you're asking a clarifying question about something I've said, it would be helpful if, if you put uh, clarification or for clarification at the start of that. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's something that can wait for the end, that's that's fine too. Uh, but I'll try to try to monitor those while I read through my notes here and, and we'll see how well this goes managing two things at once, which we know is always always a recipe for disaster. Um, all right, so, so here's the, the context here. And the, and the question is what Pope Francis meant uh, when he said uh, that people have a right to a family. So in October, there was a documentary released Pope, featuring Pope Francis, and he supported, he articulated his support for same-sex sex unions in a legal context, but not in, in a moral context, uh, and that's important. But he did seem to be signaling this new openness to um, the LGBT community and potentially opening the door to this larger vision of family that might include families headed by uh, other than heterosexual couples. So in the statement, he appears to reaffirm gay persons as children of God. He recalls that he has in the past in Argentina supported legislation for civil unions. And he says that gay persons, quote, have a right to a family. So they were provocative. Um, and of course, immediately questions came up as to where the origins of these phrases came from or the origins of the Pope's words came from and their intended meaning. Um, now, the first caveat here is they were personal sentiments of the Pope. So he was delivering them in an interview format. So they do not carry uh, any sort of strong authoritative um, value for the Catholic Church, right? So um, there's a differentiation made in Catholicism between the Pope as a person and the Pope as the office holder, right? So uh, when the Pope speaks as the Pope, as the holder of the office, uh, his words carry uh, authority and there's different levels of, of how that works. Uh, but when the Pope speaks as an individual, he still remains the Pope, right? But he's also still, uh, but he also can express personal sentiments, personal opinions that are not intended to have doctrinal weight, uh, but instead just, just clarify his understanding of things. And so that's what these words constitute in a documentary. They're showing you who the person of, of Pope Francis is, and they're not intended to be, um, to change Catholic, Catholic doctrine. Nonetheless, they might signal important things about the way Francis hopes to see the church uh, move uh, in, in the future. Um, so what happened is immediately we have a number of Catholic theologians start to interpret these things for the public online. And some believe that it was signaling the sort of new openness by shifting the tone um, of the church's approach to same-sex headed families. Others thought it was introducing a more graduated understanding of the family, uh, something that would imply that some family forms uh, may fully realize authentic Christian family life, but other family forms may be um, incomplete in certain ways, but nonetheless, in some sense, participate uh, in, in authentic Catholic family life. Uh, that's something that was proposed at the Synod of Bishops a few years ago and, and didn't um, carry much weight, but it is how Catholicism uh, came from a very exclusivist understanding of Catholicism as the one true faith and all other faith is faith traditions as essentially um, deceptive or leading away from the truth uh, to what happened in, in Vatican II, where you have this understand that all people are drawn to God in certain ways, and that all traditions then, faith traditions, are manifestations of that human desire for the divine. And so you get this graduated understanding of religions that they all sort of participate in the same impulse towards God, but some realize them more than others. And of course, Catholicism sort of sends itself in the middle, Christianity, and then um, Judaism and Islam, because they are um, monotheistic religions, and then it sort of moves out um, from there. 
so anyway, could something like that be happening in Catholic understandings uh, of the family as well was sort of the other suggestion uh, going on. Uh, and then other people were just kind of confused by what the Pope's words, like how you could reconcile this um, openness, this idea of a right to the family with existing church teaching, uh, which isn't always that hospitable, uh, which led to a good degree of skepticism about the authenticity of these statements. And in fact, that was um, verified shortly after, a week or two after. Uh, and if you're interested, I, I didn't find the link right before this, but uh, America Magazine Online had a podcast with Colleen Dilley and Gerald Gerard, Gerard O'Connell. Um, and, and they kind of talked through the history of, of what emerged after this, like where the clips came from and everything. Um, so if you're really, really interested in finding this out and, and you know, skeptical of what I have to tell you, <laughs> don't trust me. Um, that would be a, a good source to visit. Um, but basically what was discovered was that uh, in the process of making the documentary, um, the, the editor or the director was given access to some archives of older footage of interviews with the Pope. And as it so happens, the Pope gives interviews in, in similar rooms in the Vatican and is often wearing the same outfit. <laughs> it's a little hard to tell when he gave an interview, if it was a few years ago or if it was the same time. Uh, and so it appears that some of that footage was um, spliced together. Uh, so one of the first things that emerged from Rome was, first of all, uh, the Vatican, Vatican clarifying that Pope Francis had in the past expressed support for civil unions. So this was nothing new, uh, nothing to see here kind of mentality, which I think was designed to kind of tamp down both suspicions and fears that something new might be going on. Um, but ultimately, what we found in the documentary is this this cutting of different questions that that um, were around the Pope's response. So first of all, the question that actually prompted part of the Pope's response was cut, so it didn't appear like what he was answering. And then in, in, in a later part, um, Francis reiterates uh, his understanding that same-sex sexual acts can never be morally justified uh, as a second part of his response to a question, and then that got cut. So the footage was misleading. The words were the Pope's, but there was a bit more context uh, going on than, than what was said there. Um, so it's, what, what's interesting to focusing, focus on here is that um, while, yeah, while the footage was more sensational than it ought to have been, uh, there was still some important stuff uh, going on here. There's things that Catholics still need to sort of reconcile um, with, with what the Pope was saying, even once we understand the context, because nonetheless, they are the Pope's words. Uh, even when there's a bit more to understand. Um, so when we look at his support for civil union legislation, this is something that that happened when Pope Francis was in Argentina, but something he'd once already repeated while Pope, um, that he had supported that. So it seems like a position that he is is firm in, um, that his he felt that he was right to support civil union legislation uh, when he was among the bishops in Argentina and Argentina was considering a civil unions law. Um, and what's different here is that according to um, the recent Catholic teaching on this issue, um, the, the teaching from the Vatican uh, in the last couple of decades makes it pretty clear uh, that this is a cut and dry issue, that Catholics cannot support uh, same-sex unions because um, same-sex sexual acts are always wrong and because um, of the possibility of, of threatening the traditional uh, marriage. Uh, but what the Pope is saying is that he, he understood that, he understood Catholic teaching, but he, he, his reason follows a little bit different pattern. So whereas the Catholic Church's framing of same-sex unions um, so that's an issue that intersects both social realities and sort of private personal morality, right? So you've got the sexuality component in there, along with the legislative legal component in there. And the documents from the Vatican over the last couple of decades tend 
tended to frame this very much on the side of the sexual prohibitions. And so it was a very black and white absolute kind of teaching. Uh, what Francis seems to have done uh, as an archbishop is really think about this more as a social question. Um, and so his, his pattern of reasoning seems to follow um, social ethical reasoning in, in Catholic thought, where you're more inclined to think about the principles and then think about the situation and think about the ability towards which you can realize the principles in this given situation. And in fact, that's how the Pope clarifies what his intention was. He, he matched the intention in the institutional church, namely in seeing that uh, in affirming uh, his belief that same-sex sexual acts are always wrong and that um, legal marriage as a union of, of male and female needs to be protected. And so his primary motivation for supporting civil unions uh, was, was to um, create an institution that was not legal marriage, right? And so in doing that, he had the understanding that he was in fact doing what the church intended to do in protecting legal marriage. Uh, and in the context of Argentina, uh, feeling like it was legal marriage that was on uh, in public view, um, knowing that he couldn't stop anything from happening, civil union legislation becomes a way of protecting legal marriage while also recognizing the reality uh, of this push for, for same-sex um, rights to, to unions. What Francis has done um, that's a bit different from Vatican documents is recognize that legal unions, uh, such as uh, civil, civil unions, do provide rights to persons that are important uh, and that are good for people and secure human well-being and human dignity, right? So sort of cutting the whole sexual and gender concern out of it and just saying what do people need to live healthy lives? Well, to have someone who's watch, watching out for them, who's with them, and who um, has the legal rights um, to act on their behalf. Um, as, as we have with marriage partners. Uh, Francis seems to be aware that, that those are basic human goods. And so there's also a positive reason uh, why same-sex unions um, might serve an important role, even while his, his, um, one of his main concerns is making sure that civil unions are not uh, recognized as marriage. And so there's not that uh, confusion there. Um, So what Francis does then is think about how it is uh, that his concerns um, for protecting dignity and protecting marriage could be played out in the context of Argentina. And he came to this sort of conditional judgment that in these particular circumstances, the best way to proceed was to support civil unions because of number one, the good of predict protecting traditional legal marriage, and number two, the good of protecting basic uh, um, legal rights that secure dignity. Um, and therefore, that's what his stance. And it appears that he stands behind that stance. Um, and so even while his intentions are, are pretty much in parallel with, with it, where the Catholic Church was at, what's interesting is the way he framed the issue uh, is not. So in departing from this absolute judgment of Catholics ought never support this, instead he adopts this approach of knowing what it is that the Catholic Church desires in this time and in this place, to what extent can that be upheld? He shifts from the framework that's more, that's more characteristic of private morality to the framework of social morality um, on an issue that, as I said at the beginning, is an interesting case study because it intersects the two worlds, because it's about how public policy deals with something that the Catholic Church understands is very much um, of private concern, which is human sexuality. Um, so what happens then is, is he sort of, Francis sort of tilts this framework in, in the certain social ethical tradition, which, you know, at this intersection, teaching prior to this had gone one way, 
he instead pushes it the other way. And that's going to set up an interesting, um, interesting uh, dynamic here as we look towards what the implications of this way be, might be. Because in a sense, he's trying to operate within the boundaries of Catholic teaching, but he also is, in a sense, going against the grain of that teaching, and that, that puts him in an, an interesting uh, spot. The other important issue here, so the one thing, Cal Francis supported civil unions. He justifies it according to traditional Catholic moral theories. However, they don't happen to be the way that Catholic teaching um, of the early 2000s had framed the issue. So there's a departure from the recent tradition that is made on, on the back of reasoning that follows the longer tradition. Um, so, so that's the issue of, of civil unions. But then there's also this, his concluding argument that um, gay persons have a right to a family. Um, and this idea of a right to a family is really interesting. And, and the one thing that uh, I was immediately suspicious of um, was that I didn't think this was a family in terms of uh, same-sex couples have a right to form a family. Um, regardless of, of anyone's personal views, I just didn't think that was something that would be permissible in Catholic teaching uh, as it now stands. And, and Francis, even though he's reform-minded, tends not to be uh, quite that, that much um, when it comes specifically to issues uh, around um, sexuality and gender. Uh, he seems very much cut from John Paul II's cloth on those issues. And so it'd be unlikely that he would, in, in such an assertive way, um, go against uh, teachings that had come out under John Paul II, who seems to be his guide on most of these things. Um, so it, it probably didn't mean that same-sex couples have a right to form a family. So what might it have meant? My initial suspicion was it probably meant uh, he was probably thinking about the church metaphorically as a family, the family of, of the church, uh, and therefore uh, seems as couples have a right to be included uh, in, in the church, uh, which would then be more consistent with existing teaching and also consistent uh, to what Francis himself had said in the past uh, regarding uh, sexuality and the need uh, for an encounter and conclusion. Uh, as it turned out, uh, when the information about the origins of the documents came out, is I was only partially right. Uh, I was right that he was sort of he was not entertaining the idea that that same sex couples have a right to form a family, um, and he was using the church loosely, metaphorically, as a family. But actually, his primary concern was with families of origin, that uh, homosexual persons should not be um, should not be uh, kicked out or you know left alone by their family of origin uh, that instead families need to sort of stick together uh, and that sexuality uh, should not be a barrier to that and what's interesting is he seems to be suggesting that even for uh, even for persons who are in same-sex romantic relationships they still retain that more basic right to a family. And so they sort of have a right um, to be included in that family, even when their, their living situation uh, is not uh, what, the, what the Catholic Church would, would morally approve of. Uh, and that seems to extend both ways to families of origin and the family of the church uh, in, in the more metaphorical sense. Uh, and we see that Francis has uh, some stories of Francis's encounter um, with different individuals would back up his idea um, that same-sex couples ought to approach priests and explain their understanding and, and their desire to be a part of the church and work out at the parish level uh, the extent to which they can be included uh, within parish life given their uh, particular situation. Uh, and so what's interesting then is that the Francis seems to be telling Catholic families and Catholic parishes that they ought not to exclude gay persons or same-sex couples because people, as sort of a matter of human dignity, people have a right to be included in, in family, in family life, right? Either the family of origin uh, and also in, in Christianity through the inclusion within the community of the church. What's interesting here is that 
<clears throat> Francis has not really given much of an indication of what that non-exclusion looks like, right? Uh, and I, I'd use non-exclusion here because he hasn't actually said what inclusion looks like. He just says, you know, if people have a right to be included, then that would mean that as Christians, we have a duty not to exclude. Um, but what it means to include in the positive sense is where things get a little tricky and where we don't have guidance from the Pope. Uh, and this becomes something that's pretty interesting to kind of think about where we're at. And so the concern here, and, and this is sort of the catch here, when you move to how it is then that Christians ought to include, the, the challenge is that because Francis is in some sense articulating Catholic understanding against the grain of some earlier documents, some of those earlier documents have not been very hospitable uh, towards uh, homosexual persons or persons in same-sex relationships. And so when Francis is emphasizing this concern for encounter uh, and um, engagement and inclusion, he's doing so with the recent backdrop of teachings that were primarily concerned with protecting society from homosexual persons and same-sex relationships, right? And so he's saying we need to welcome, we need to be inclusive, we need to engage. But the recent tradition before him is not at all concerned with those things. And in fact, is concerned primarily with, with how to sort of keep those things uh, at bay or away from um, the normal accepted uh, parts of, of everyday society. So what happens here is that you have Francis saying we need to include, but according to statements either within the framework of or explicitly stated by recent Catholic teaching, that inclusion doesn't mean that you have to support uh, supporting LGBT people against discrimination in employment or housing. Uh, those are both justifiable under contemporary Catholic teaching. Um, you don't have to counter debunked myths about homosexuality as sort of an impermanent psychological condition. You don't have to dispute uh, people who think that homosexual persons are actively threats to children just by nature of their sexuality. Um, you don't need to recognize any significance or validity in same-sex romantic relationships or even believe that there's a possibility that they might be based somehow in love or commitment. Uh, in fact, you're welcome to just simply believe that they're the result of self-gratifying lust or disordered sexual desires. Um, you do not have to believe that same-sex relationships constitute anything remotely analogous to the relationship of marriage. In fact, you're encouraged not to believe that. Um, nor that same-sex partners with, ch with children ought to be considered a family in, in any form or legitimate sense. Um, so you don't have to acknowledge that same-sex couples have a right to be raising kids uh, in the first place, or even that same-sex couples might be capable of raising children without actively causing harm to those kids, right? Um, and so, you know, Catholics stand in various positions on this, but I think we can recognize that some of those teachings come off as, as, as fairly harsh. These are not um, compassionate encounters with the needs of homosexual persons. They are teachings framed by a backdrop of, of trying to protect society from homosexual persons. Uh, and so when you set inclusion within these boundaries, we end up in, in sort of a paradox here. What, what is a hospital approach hospitable approach means when the reaching, recent teaching has framed the issue as anything but hospitable, as trying to distance and, and keep distance from. Um, recent teaching does repeatedly assert the dignity of homosexual persons. That is true, but it does not explore what recognition or protection of that dignity really looks like in the sort of way that Francis himself is contemplating. Um, and so we've got this difficult spot going on here where Francis is attempting to articulate a, a different mode of Catholic encounter with the world, um, but that, that mode is, is pretty largely constrained by 
the history that he himself uh, also feels uh, beholden to. Um, and so you can change the moral tone, but that doesn't change the fact of history and what's already been said. Uh, the further context of this is that uh, the bishops in the U.S. are divided on this issue. You couldn't get the bishops to all probably agree on one statement on this. Uh, and the bishops globally are, are probably even more divided. Uh, and so while Francis himself as the pope has the authority to override some of these earlier teachings, most of which came from um, dicasteries or offices within the Vatican, not from a previous pope himself. Um, so Francis has that authority, but it's unlikely he's going to exercise that in any meaningful way because the, the leadership of the Catholic Church has diverse opinions on this and frankly are just in some extent divided about Francis's own um, vision of a more welcoming, um, inclusive type of, of Catholicism. Um, one of the key elements here is that um, Catholic teaching still um, understands homosexuality as an objective disorder, meaning that it is uh, a moral condition that is by nature of its object or its intent um, always uh, morally problematic. And because of that, the Catholic Church uses the term just discrimination, which means justifiable discrimination. So um, when, it, when it talks about the inclusion of LGBT, LGBTQ persons in society, it's often contextualized with this idea that some discrimination is justified. Um, I think in the American context in the last generation, uh, we've seen that um, our understanding of what types of discrimination might be justified has moved quite a bit um, from where, where the documents of the Vatican uh, still stand today. Uh, nonetheless, though, tone is important, right? It matters, uh, the vision and, and the type of, um, type of way you're conveying uh, your belief. And so Francis does seem to be repeatedly concerned about people who see doctrinal commitments or Catholic teaching as absolutes that ought to be used against others, uh, rather than as something that should point us towards encounter with others. Um, and so he continues to criticize really rigid applications of doctrine or sort of preoccupations uh, with morality that damage um, an inclusive community and, and fellowship among Christians. Uh, and so that has led Francis to, to seemingly want to pivot some of these concerns um, in a way that focuses more on upholding human dignity and creating solidarity among persons, even when there are, there are differences uh, of understanding uh, or other things that are that are sort of blocking full agreement on everything. But Francis seems to be of the mind that you don't have to agree on everything in order to participate in the community of the church, or probably as we know from families, you don't have to agree on everything to still get along as a family. And Francis sometimes uses some fairly colorful uh, examples of this, uh, but it seems he envisions the church to function more like a family where we all know we have a place and we belong even when, um, our interpersonal conflicts can be quite messy. Um, so that's kind of uh, how I wanted to explain and frame these questions to think about here. This, this different approach that Francis is trying to take um, to say, uh, number one, that we can think about some things that were cut and dry. We can think about those maybe in different ways with his approach to civil unions. Um, and, and number two, with this understanding of right to the family, what that means, and then also that we have to think through the implications of that uh, in light of a, of a community of faith that we want to be uh, inclusive and welcoming and, and spreading the good news to the extent possible, uh, which really does, does change the tone. Um, but at the same time, uh, that does leave us hemmed in by what we've said in the past. And we have obligations to both those things, the vision of the future and in our, in our tradition. Uh, so we stand at, at kind of an interesting um, crossroads, I think, right now. <laughs>
so I'm going to wrap up my portion of this relatively soon and then and then open it up for questions. Um, but just to kind of contextualize this and some things that we're seeing today, uh, it is interesting that shortly before Francis had made these comments, the US Supreme Court had heard the arguments from Fulton versus Philadelphia, which is a case that was about the obligation of Catholic adoption agencies, primarily Catholic uh, social services, um, to adopt to same-sex couples. And that is something that Catholic adoption agencies had done uh, a little bit of, not too much, until the early 2000s when, when the Vatican said, stop that. And then there were some, then shortly after that, we have um, same civil unions, same-sex civil unions, and then ultimately um, same-sex marriage become legal in the United States. And so what do Catholic charities do in response to that? Um, and so we had, for the last 10 years, there's been legal fights going on between Catholic adoption agencies who want to continue to serve the public through taking on publicly funded adoption cases, but do not want to adopt to same-sex couples. Um, and so that has gone through a, a number of state courts and has now reached the Supreme Court. There are arguments for that this fall, and those will likely be the decision will likely be released in the spring. What's a really interesting complication to that is the two individuals who joined the case to argue on the Catholic side were both single foster mothers. Uh, and so you have this interesting argument that a single person can raise a child, but two same-sex couple, two same-sex partners can't, um, which, which kind of complicates matters a little bit on that. Um, the other side is this fall, there was also some really important um, research released on um, LGBTQ children in the foster care system. Uh, and recent research had shown that they're disproportionately represented. Uh, and this is what uh, the most recent studies have confirmed. Now we have pretty good studies from New York and LA, and they both suggest um, that um, LGBTQ uh, youth in foster care make up something like 40 percent. So you're looking at like four to five times probably uh, the general population being represented in family care, foster care, which would suggest <laughs> that when Francis says uh, people have a right to a family not to be excluded from their families of origin, he is talking to us about a very real issue in the U.S., um, which is that on the basis of their sexuality or gender um, number of adolescents uh, are, are um, rejected by their families and have to make their way through the foster care system. And so what would um, sort of a Catholic community look like that, that was concerned about changing um, that reality? Um, within the Catholic context, uh, we have um, this, this tradition of thinking about marriage primarily is framed on heterosexual mar marriage, which is the traditional Catholic way of understanding it, um, but also thinking about all other intimate relationships, such as same-sex relationships, primarily as about the sexual acts they contain. Uh, and Francis seems to be at least suggesting that there's more to it than that. Um, but how do we as parishes start to think about inclusion and recognizing there's more to it than that when recent teaching basically says, you know, points us to say that's the key thing um, and that's it. And then finally, framing all of this in terms of our reception as American Catholics is what Pope Francis recognized in his recent document, Christus Vivit, uh, on, on evangelization to young people, which is that the Catholic leadership still remains sort of uh, hampered by fallout over the clerical abuse crisis. And so, um, as long as you have um, Catholic leadership wrapped up in this public perception of immoral sexual activity, you're not going to get the sort of public confidence in their judgments about things related to sexuality uh, as we may have had before that. Uh, and so there becomes a sort of ongoing question of even if the church wants to change or wants to reiterate itself in a new way that's, that's um, more convincing, um, 
American Catholics today and, and Catholics throughout large parts of the world may simply be less inclined um, to listen uh, because of that that history, that recent history uh, that we've seen there. Um, so that was that was my talk for today. Those are the points that I have uh, lined up. So I'd be happy to take any questions that people might have uh, concerning anything I've said or or where things might be going. Um, happy to talk about some of the research I've been seeing among other uh, theologians around um, other issues related to family life, which increasingly seems to be something that's spreading out uh, throughout Christian ethics. I was just talking to someone the other day who was saying, you just can't do any social ethics anymore without talking about families. Like, you want to talk about immigration? You could talk about families. You want to talk about the environment? You got to talk about families. Uh, and so it is interesting to the extent to which this is, is becoming a, a broader concern uh, among among Catholics. So I can't see you out there, but I'd be happy to take your questions. Between uh, Pius and John, so uh, someone's asking me if I can talk about the change in parenting views between Pius and John Paul II. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a lot of Pope Piuses out there, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. <laughs> um, but the least, the most recent one was was Pope Pius the 12th, and he comes right before John uh, the 23rd, who of course is the one who initiates uh, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and there, there is a really significant shift um, in papal teaching around parenting. Um, that takes place in the 20th century. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, understanding that Catholic families were explicitly hierarchical. So you've got God, you've got the husband, you've got the wife, and you've got the kids. And that was understood to be the proper order of things. And it was one of the reasons um, uh, Catholics you know, supported very clear gender roles uh, with husbands in the public economic sphere and, and women in the, in the private domestic sphere of, of the home and women primarily charged with um, raising children and, and husbands primarily charged with um, uh, wages, earning wages and, and protecting and providing for the family. Uh, what's interesting is <laughs> There's a real shift in Catholic understanding of gender that takes place around Vatican II, but the shift in parenting sort of stays set and it sets up this, this difficult situation. So you have um, Pope Pius XI back in 1930, who said something to the effect of, you know, women should never, um, it's by women's own dignity that they ought to be, you know, more or less confined to the home, that they ought to be in charge of domestic things, right? That's where women realize their dignity as persons is, is in the home, not in public life. And then you have John the 23rd, then uh, 30 some years later, who says uh, that because of women's growing recognition of her own dignity, she's come to claim a broader place in public life, right? And so this, the church shifts to this understanding of, oh, well, it's not just uh, in the home that women's dignity can be recognized, but women have a right to public participation uh, in a way that their voices are heard uh, and can shape society. What doesn't shift is a view of parenting that still sees men as providers and women as nurturers. Uh, and so what you end up getting then throughout, and this becomes quite evident in John Paul II's thinking, is men remain relatively constrained to being the providers uh, of the household. But women are both providers and nurturers, right? So women get double the work uh, because one door is opened up but the male door back into nurturing isn't opened up. Uh, and so you really don't find uh, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s and 90s, um, there's only, as far as I'm aware, there's one document from the USCCB, the Catholic bishops, um, the NCCB back at that time, um, that talks about men as, as having an obligation to nurture children. Everything else that I'm aware of 
primarily thinks about men as indirect parents in terms of, of um, parenting children. So men support women in their motherhood. Uh, and so the male role in parenting is primarily to sort of oversee, supervise the family and to be supportive of the wife who is really seen as the one who's engaged directly with the children. Uh, and so that's become, I think, a pretty big blind spot in Catholic teaching that is starting to be addressed a little bit more. Um, I was happy to see Francis, you know, right away added uh, Joseph to the liturgy uh, to, rec to recognize um, the importance of fatherhood. Um, but I haven't, there's not been a lot of shift on that. So it's really interesting in terms of parenthood um, that the understanding of what women ought to be uh, has been opened um, to, to both public and private life. Uh, mean, but bringing men into private life uh, has, has something that took a bit longer and it's kind of just starting to be, to show up a little bit more um, now. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I've got another one here that's asking what actions might be okayed as justified discrimination. Yeah, um, this is this is a, I think a really important caveat um, because um, so discrimination obviously just making choices about what can or cannot be. Um, justified discrimination would suggest that there are reasons why certain things have to be prohibited even though um, they might be allowed for, for other people. Um, and what we see in, in Catholic thinking is this um, condemnation of unjust discrimination, which suggests, which I, I have to be clear here, it's not saying that discrimination by its nature is unjust. That's not what it's saying. <laughs> it's saying that it condemns those types of discrimination that are not justified. So this has not been revised, but I believe it's in the 2003 document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF, in which it argues that persons and, and persons who are known to be homosexual, and it makes a pretty big judgment here that if people know someone's homosexual, then that means that person is sort of willing to engage in, in the homosexual lifestyle, as, as the Vatican liked to call it back then. Uh, it sort of suggested that, at least in the early 2000s, the thinking was primarily, you know, secrecy was kind of the best way to go, which is not where we're at now, but at least that's where it was uh, at that time. Um, and so the argument was, if someone is known to be homosexual, then you can guess that they're going to be engaging in a homosexual lifestyle and you don't want um, that to be around children or families or people who, who, should, who would be vulnerable to, to seeing that as normal. Uh, and so a document uh, from 2003 from the CDF states that um, homosexual persons can be discriminated against in the, issue, in the areas of education or housing uh, because their presence might cause an active threat uh, to the development of children. Now, I think many of us might find reasons to question that today. Uh, and it, it helps that our understanding of homosexuality has shifted quite a bit in the last 20 years um, where we can understand, well, there's a number of, of Catholics out there uh, who are open about their sexuality and, and also uh, reject you know, the idea that they're going to um, necessarily act on that in a specific way. Uh, and so we've seen different witnesses from since then that have, have made that more complex. The problem that I was pointing out is that no document since then has revised it in any way. So the teaching still stands even as our understanding of the issues and situation has evolved over time. Uh, and what I was trying to, to get to is it's unclear to me what the path forward looks like at this point if you're not going to revise or clarify that teaching. Um, and also want to be um, more inclusive. Um, other, you know, the, the probably big problematic background here is um, the Catholic Church from basically the 15th through 19th century used the term unjustified slavery a lot. It supported the institution of slavery, 
but also wanted to condemn the excesses of it. And so um, that, that term justified discrimination does sort of, uh, for anybody who's, who's uh, conversant with history, um, does sort of raise a red flag about other things that we've articulated as Catholics as justified versus unjustified um, that we might regret now. Uh, on the other hand, you might say there there is sort of justified discrimination out there, right? There are things where, yeah, you have to say this, sure, there's a right that exists for most people, but but not for you, and there's good reasons for that, right? So um, <clears throat> if you're going to be a paramedic, there's lots of disabilities that you simply can't have, and it's not right to discriminate against people with disabilities, but there are also jobs that call for able-bodied persons. And so something like that would be an example where you could call that justified discrimination, recognizing that there is discrimination going on, that, that someone is being prohibited from doing something that they may want to do that's open to other people, but there's a higher reason behind it um, that justifies it. So I'm not saying this, this whole idea of justified discrimination is is hogwash or anything. I think there is some reason for it. Um, but I just want to point out that it has a history of being used in ways um, that are problematic uh, and that uh, seem like they might remain problematic today. Uh, is there some similarity, someone's asking, is there some similarity between sexual activity of two men and a non-married heterosexual couple? Um, Yeah, so this is, uh, in terms of understanding in light of the family, that's an interesting question. So what, what I was getting at towards the end here is, is Catholic adoption agencies have been okay with adopting to single persons, but not to same-sex couples. So the pretty obvious workaround there is to adopt as a single person and then get married, right, uh, after the adoption is final. Um, but there seems to be a pretty big presumption there, and that is that single persons, we don't have to worry about their sexual activity because they're single, uh, which in American culture today, I think we could all suggest that's probably not a safe assumption uh, for, for a lot of adults. Um, and so believing that simple marital status or relational status in the present somehow speaks to um, uh, sexual activity, either, either at the present or foreseeable, is is somewhat problematic um and so catholic charities and uh, catholic social services uh they do have different adoption practices in different locations but in general um they do adopt to single um single uh, adoptees and therefore, if someone's in a cohabitating or in a relationship like that in catholic teaching either same-sex or non-married heterosexual, you're both in prohibited sexual relationships and neither of them is good. Um, I, I would say there has been a something of a bias in, in Catholic teaching to think that same-sex sexual activity is, is another level of not good um, because oftentimes heterosexual couples are... First of all, heterosexual couples can simply normalize their relationship, right? There's a pathway towards sacramental marriage there uh, that simply doesn't exist on the other hand. So while both might be viewed as moral problems that prohibit family life from the Catholic Church's point of view, only one of them actually still opens up a pathway to sacramental marriage and authentic family life and Catholic understanding. So in that sense, there is, there is a significant um, difference. But in the sense of just the sexual acts themselves as, as their moral um, standing from, from the Catholic perspective, both would be um, objectively wrong in the sense that they're, they're never justified um, uh, because Catholic teaching uh, states that um, sexual activity is only um, permissible within uh, sacramental marriage or within marriage, I guess it doesn't have to be sacramental, but within marriage. Uh, not seeing more questions out here. Let me 
Let's think of what else I might have to say. No one's asking questions because I know I'll give too long of an answer. That's it. I'll be more concise. Then we ask more questions. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, here's another question. So um, can you ever see the church separating the two ends of, of sex and marriage? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, so in Catholic teaching, sexual, sexual intercourse has, has two ends or two goals that it achieves, uh, interpersonal union and procreation, right? So there's often talking about the unitive and procreative ends of, of sexuality. Uh, so sexual, uh, sexual intercourse should foster interpersonal, interpersonal union, and according to Catholic teaching, has to be open to procreation. And what we mean by open to procreation is of a form that could be procreative. Uh, and so that's, um, first of all, why all same-sex sexual acts are, are off the table, uh, but also why contraception is seen as off the table. Um, but natural family planning is seen as permittable because the sexual act itself remains the type of act that is open to um, procreation, uh, even though natural family planning is based on the idea of, of knowing that it's unlikely to be uh, at that time. One of the interesting things that happens is that the, the two ends of sex and the two ends of marriage are articulated as the same. So marriage is meant to be the build the union of persons and lead to procreation and sexes. And so that's why often um, sex is called the marital act uh, in, in Catholic teaching, um, because in a sense, sexual intercourse is seen as kind of condensing um, all that marriage is in, into one moment. Um, speaking of someone who's married, uh, I'm just not totally convinced uh, that um, that that's that's an accurate understanding of how most married people understand sex. Um, there's an author out there, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he makes a pretty good argument that the problem is not that the church um, doesn't appreciate sex is that over appreciate sex that sex in marital life for those of us uh who are married for a long time and that's <laughs> long time for me is coming up on 15 years i bet some of you are well beyond that so <laughs> you might say i'm still just getting started um but sex between spouses becomes a a part of the marriage a part of the rhythm of life it's an event that that unites that's you know um but i don't think it is always the great experience that really condenses all it means to be married into one specific act in the way that's often talked about in Catholic teaching as if that's what it was. Um, and I, I suspect there's, there's a good bit of sort of clerical thinking going on behind this that, um, well, <laughs> this happened in a doctrinal seminar. Uh, there was a priest in there uh, who was doing a PhD in, in a seminar with me and we were talking about sexuality and just sexual intercourse and at one point he just blurted out how much sex are you guys having <laughs> so sometimes i think celibacy uh has been and can be really framed i mean it should be a, a positive vocation to a call of a certain type of life um, but i think there has been in the catholic tradition also a more problematic way of framing celibacy primarily as the absence of sex um which I then think has, has given rise to a culture of thinking about sex as this, you know, this grand thing out there that sort of takes on more of a mythical quality than I think most married couples would kind of say that it has, right? Um, and so that becomes a key challenge here. Is it appropriate to really reduce marriage to sex? Um, and obviously marriage serves broader purposes and more complex uh, than the sexual act itself. Um, and so if we're going to think about families that are not framed primarily around heterosexual marriage and the quality of heterosexual marriage is not framed primarily around permissible sexual acts, then we would have to start articulating 
purposes and goals for marriage and sexuality that are that are at least more distinct than they are now. Uh, and I, I certainly can't imagine that. Um, I think what Francis does sometimes, although on this issue he's not he's not the kind of person to to move much. As I said, I think he's very much cut from John Paul II's cloth, so he's much more inclined to affirm uh, rather than change what what uh, existing teaching is. But I do think, at least as a parallel pathway, you do see um, Francis often inviting us to encounter and engage and think about before before immediately making moral judgments to try to come to understand an itch, itch issue and a situation, things like that, and encounter persons and their problems. And I think from there, I think we can see that, yeah, if, if, the, if the church were to spend a bit more time reflecting on the complexity of marriage, um, we would probably see uh, the beginnings of distancing um, between the sexual act and marriage as having related, intertwined, but but also different uh, ends and purposes. So I can imagine that. I, I don't think it's, I think the present situation comes primarily from um, a lack of engagement caused by various historical reasons. Okay, we're starting to see more um, questions coming in. So thank you uh, to those of you who have read some things. Uh, so someone's asking that uh, years ago, um, in in a in a uh, school in a class, uh, she found some official rituals from the Vatican archives. That sounds really interesting already. Uh, the church used centuries ago to bless same-sex unions, even though they weren't married. Uh, yes, uh, okay, that is something I've come across, and I'm, I'm blank on the author's name. Who wrote that book? Um, the book is called Same-Sex Unions in Pre-Modern Europe. Um, of course, I'm blanking on the author's name. Uh, that basically argued uh, he was given access to the Vatican archives. And so I think this was in the 90s. So I don't know if that's when you were in grad school, but it might be um, when this research was really, really fresh. He came across some rituals in, in the Vatican archives uh, from the Middle Ages that um, certainly seemed like they were blessings of same-sex unions. Uh, and then... <laughs> I believe the story goes then he was never invited back uh, for a follow-up book. <laughs> um, so I have seen that. Um, the argument the author makes is a bit less clear than, than my understanding of, of where scholars are at on those sources. Um, that he, there were rituals that blessed um, unions of persons. It's unclear if any sort of sexual dimension would have been understood within those, those unions. Um, and so, um, I mean, the middle ages were, were diverse and, and complex and I'm not a medievalist, so I don't have a lot to speak about here, but my understanding of it is um, the initial book made claims that are, are probably stronger than can be supported. Uh, and that while there were blessings of partnerships, um, they may have been committing um, to the long-term commitment to the other person's good, um, but not in any, in any sort of romantic sexual way as we would understand um, such unions today. Uh, and so some people think of them more as blessings of, of friendships or as friendships um, rather than same-sex unions. People did in the privacy of their homes idea <laughs> and I, I shouldn't really comment on that, um, but I do know that that yeah, this idea that um, the church did bless same-sex unions in the Middle Ages and then kind of forgot about it, it's it's more complex than that. Would most parents prefer their gay child to be in a permanent gay relationship? Well, that is a good question. I don't know the um, I don't know the statistics on that. I can tell you that it's certainly moving, right? If you would ask that question in the 1960s, I would guess you'd get a very different response, right? Uh, and so that's, I think, part of the reality. I talked about it a little bit earlier. Part of the reality is our understanding, our social understanding, our social engagement with uh, human sexuality moves so quickly these days, right? If you went back to 2000, or you know, watch watch shows or movies from the 80s or 90s. Uh, 
you know, they pick up on there's there's a real evolution going on here. And so while we have this this um, teaching from the Vatican in recent decades, uh, the speed which with the church's thinking on an issue unfolds and the speed with its social thinking on an issue unfolds are, are different paces, right? Like um, very different paces. Uh, and so some people have argued like, uh, Catholic teaching on sexuality is or on homosexuality is really only 50 years old because that's like when our modern understanding of, of homosexuality emerges. And so everything from that's been sort of trying to grapple with um, a modern understanding, which is different than than what came before it. Um, so my suspicion would be an increasing number of parents would happily like to see their gay child in a permanent committed relationship, right? Um, I think people who are happily married um, or have uh, long-term relationships generally find a great deal of human uh, goods and human joy in them. And I think you're seeing increasingly uh, parents being less concerned um, with the sexuality of the child and more concerned with their um, personal well-being and happiness. It is interesting that when I talked about those figures from foster care, um, the foster care youth are um, disproportionately also racially represented uh, by Hispanic and African American communities, which also tend to hold more conservative views of, of sexuality, uh, particularly on the question of homosexuality. Um, and so there, there does seem to be um, different paces at which different demographics are, are moving on this issue. Um, but yeah, it does seem to be that um, parents today are much more inclined um, to, to want to see their child in, in a committed relationship, regardless of their sexual orientation, um, than they were in the past. <laughs> yeah, someone else is just chiming in to say uh, they also think uh, celibates tend to over imagine um, the importance of sex. Um, not to say that sex doesn't have value and shouldn't be meaningful, but um, I think that is something we face in a church that has one specific body of one specific type of people um, that has tended to give all the teaching throughout history is you get certain biases coming through. Is it fair for Francis to want to change attitudes, but not doctrine? Can you really do that? <laughs> That's a good question. Implied in my whole setup for this is I'm not so sure we can. Um, on the other hand, I would say if he were to change, if he were to override or reinterpret existing teaching, um, he'd be changing doctrine with sort of a small D. These are most of um, the social issues concerning how societies regulate and deal with civil unions or, um, or, or, um, discrimination around sexuality and things like that. Those are more particular um, issues. And so if, if he were to simply reinterpret those teachings in light of where we're at today and change the guidelines, I think that would be totally within the norms of, of the papal office. Where it would get more challenging is making that shift to thinking about family life as separable from married life, heterosexual marriage, uh, and think about marriage as having some distance from being able uh, to be kind of compressed into thoughts about sexual, sexual activity. Um, and so there you do have a longer tradition that has framed these things in a particular way that would need to be unpacked a bit more. Um, and so, yeah, it, it sort of depends on the level of teaching you're talking about. I think there's some relatively small things he could do that would be reasonably understood. Um, but then there's some, the bigger issues that are sort of behind it. Um, and those would be more difficult, um, not only because it's not clear to me that Frank uh, is at all interested in changing some of those things, um, but also it's not clear to me that he would have the support of, of the bishops. Um, and back in the day, popes <laughs> could kind of enforce their will, uh, and, and bishops accepted the pope's words, although they often ignored it, 
um, but at least they, in, in theory, accepted the Pope's authority. Um, but with the more collegial church welcome in the Vatican II, to some extent, at least the Catholic Church pays lip service to believing that the communion of the bishops is important. And Francis himself has very much shifted to saying he wants a church that's lively, that has debates, that has disagreements. Uh, and when very sharp criticisms arise of him, the kind of criticisms that I just can't see other recent popes tolerating, um, Francis is typically just let him sit. Like he doesn't usually respond, but he also doesn't try to quench it, right? He just um, sort of just lets the criticism stand um, as a part of, of a church with, with differences of opinions among its membership. Uh, even when those are, are basically attacks aimed, aimed at him and his exercise of the pap papacy. So the bottom line here is I don't think Francis's model of reform could do the type of dramatic doctrinal changes from the papal office um, that, the, that this might envision. I think he sees reform as, as a process of dialogue that unfolds over time uh, and requires some consent by at least a majority of the bishops and, and at least no um, significant strong strong dissent um, to sort of understand that that's where the spirit's moving the church. So because he's not, um, he doesn't exercise the papacy in a, in a sort of dictatorial way. Um, and I don't see the possibility of, of the world bishops agreeing on some of these issues in the near future. I think it's unlikely that we'll see significant doctrinal changes, but I do think we'll continue to see um, encouragements about changing attitudes and articulations of pastoral care that will start to develop and start to relativize some of the doctrines or at least shed a new light on them that hasn't been thought about before. Um, but no, I wouldn't expect dramatic change uh, anytime soon. All right. Uh, oh, I got another message just coming in. <laughs> Someone's asking, does the tradition define the family by who was raising the children, not who conceived them? Conceived them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, what is the family? Where does it come from? And there are some different, there's a philosophical question of what, what, what's behind parenthood itself. Um, so one position would argue that if you do an act that is likely to lead to parenthood, and you can use your imagination what kind of act that would be. Um, then you accept the responsibility of parenthood should a child uh, come about. Uh, and that's more or less sort of Thomas Aquinas's argument that in the sexual act, you uh, then give their substance or whatever, and that forms into children. And therefore fathers uh, have an obligation, a moral obligation to the natural law uh, to be parents to their children. But there's another view that would say parenthood comes about from the commitment to raise a child and, you know, regardless of where that child's come from. And both of those traditions have pretty long histories uh, in the Catholic church. Um, historically families are really complex because there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, really high child mortality rates, really high mortality rates overall. Uh, and so Oh, I had this somewhere in my research, but I can't quote it exactly, but it's something vaguely along the lines of, you know, in the 12th century, uh, a woman could expect to be pregnant seven or eight times. She could expect three to four children uh, to live past the age of 12. And by the age of 14, the kids could expect that one of their parents would be dead. Okay, that would just be taking the averages of mortality rates. Um, so that's a situation. Family forms are obviously complex because people just aren't living long enough to create this sort of model of the nuclear family that we hold as traditional today. It just doesn't work um, when you have different standards, different life expectancies. Um, and so in that tradition, yeah, the Catholics also held this view of the importance of the approach to parenthood. That is who claims responsibility for that child and fulfills the role of parenthood. 
Um, and so what, what happens um, today is, first of all, I think the term family becomes very tightly wedded with this idea of the biological nuclear family. Um, and so family probably had multiple meanings. It now seems to mean one thing. Um, and that has sort of boxed out a bit of the earlier Christian concern um, that ultimately children don't belong to parents. Children belong to God. Uh, and therefore, the service to children is, is service to, to a fellow Christian, to a fellow human um, that sort of relativizes some of that. Um, and so, yeah, part of, I think, what we need to think about in, in developing our understanding of, of Catholic families today and think about the complexities that we're facing with the drop of marriage rates, with the uh, public acceptance of same-sex relationships, uh, with public acceptance of single and divorced parenthood, uh, all these things are changing, is to recognize that we are probably not so much moving into a way more complex family systems than the world has ever seen, so much as we are moving out of a period of relative stability within a very complex history. Um, and so there's... Um, some thought to be given that way. Okay, we've got one final comment from the field here. Um, someone says, in grad school several decades ago, we were told that there exist in the Vatican. Oh, oh, this is the same one that was that came before. So yes, yeah, already already answered that one. So it's interesting history, but I'm, I'm not totally convinced. Uh, okay, so so to summarize, uh, I would say that. Um, what I want to present is Pope Francis's words that got some, some play in the media, although I don't think they got a lot of um, considered attention in articulating what they meant, like we seem to be increasingly prone to do. Short reports got out there, people reacted with various forms of excitement or outrage, and then we moved on to the next thing. Uh, and I think part of thinking about what it means to be a thoughtful Catholic who understands the tradition and is thinking about where the church is today is stopping to take a breath to really think through these issues and what's going on. So as attempting to do tonight was help you look at this relatively small moment in history in October where the Pope said some things about um, same-sex couples and families that seemed shocking <laughs> or um, unique or attention grabbing at least. And just think through the implications of what that all brings up and, and hopefully to bring us to, to realize that we live in a, in a very interesting time where a number of Catholic commitments around family issues are in tension and it's not at all clear how exactly they can all be resolved. Um, because Francis here is supporting this idea of encounter and engagement and supporting human dignity but he's doing so in a way that even he seems to acknowledge is against the grain of where the Vatican and where Catholic teaching has been. Uh, and there's real questions about to what extent that road is open or to what extent any road looks open at this point. And so how do we sort of move forward as Catholics thoughtfully thinking about uh, the various issues uh, that surround us uh, on, these, on these topics? So I hope that was a concise enough summary. <laughs> Okay, that was very concise and um, a, a nice summary. Thank you for doing that. Um, thank you for the discussion, the presentation. Um, it's always challenging when we have you to, um, to interact with and I really appreciate your willingness to, um, to share your expertise and uh, the church's moral tradi tradition as well as the challenges that we face um, in real life as um, Catholics in the world today. So uh, thank you, Jacob, for that very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. I will be uh, sending you an email tomorrow that will contain a number of things. One will be the link to the evaluation form for the program tonight, um, the link to where this program will be archived in case you wanna go back and um, look at it again, or you know somebody who couldn't be here tonight, who want to, wants to see the talk, 
it'll be on our YouTube page, but I'll give you the um, precise link. Um, I'll also give you a, the link to um, a page on our website um, that kind of summarizes the, um, the whole issue about what the Pope said this fall, um, the responses that came from uh, a number of um, uh, corners, um, including the America article that uh, Jake mentioned and Jake's own article itself. Um, that's on our um, website under what did the Pope say about civil unions, but I'll send you that link as well. And then just a reminder that next week we will be back on Thursday um, and our um, presenter will be Dr. Um, Cantu Gregory from Clark University. Um, she will be new to our forum series, but comes highly recommended by both Jake and Dave Cochran. In fact, she said yes, only because the two of them told, them, told her that she should. And I think she has um, a really interesting topic that is developing as we speak more or less. And that is what, um, what impact the um, whole pandemic experience um, is having on our understanding of Eucharist as Catholics. Um, and what in, in particular this, um, the experience of not being present at Eucharist in person, um, is that changing how we appreciate Eucharist? It is, is it deepening our appreciation or um, is it um, kind of um, threatening our understanding of Eucharist? So I, I think that should be pretty interesting. Um, Jake and um, David both say that she's a great presenter um, and so that's something to look forward to next Thursday night. So to all of you, thanks for being with us. And um, to our tech support person, Paul Lee, thanks, Paul, for your help tonight. Um, may uh, we be blessed and live um, in some kind of peace and interesting times. Okay. <laughs>